Okay, so the next concept we're going to uh, learn about here is mass increase and relativistic momentum. Now, this is a slightly difficult topic, um, mostly because there's different ways of interpreting what this uh, what this mass increase is for objects that are uh, that have mass or rest mass and which are approaching the speed of light. So. Rest mass is the mass that an object has when it's stationary. It's what we define as the inertial mass uh, in terms of when you try to accelerate an object. You know, if you think about F equals ma or Newton's second law, um, based on the inertial mass of the object or the, the, the rest mass, uh, if you apply a specific force, you'll get a certain acceleration. Well, what Einstein discovered is that the relationship uh, between energy and mass via E equals mc squared tells us that energy and mass are interchangeable. They're sort of one and the same thing, much like Michael Faraday uh, discovered that electricity and magnetism were one and the same thing. and They were in in sort of woven together and we found out that space and time are woven together. You Once you start to move quickly or move at all, you start to move through space-time and affect both, both of those two um, variant uh, quantities. So it turns out that energy and mass be e equals mc squared, uh, which we can write down here, and we'll learn more about this later. It's actually going to look something like this, Einstein's sort of most famous equation. Uh, what we're going to see in the gamma is just the square root of, as we know, the gamma factor. Uh, so what we want to note here is that since there's a, a link between matter and mass and energy, uh, when we start to think about objects that start to, that have mass that start to accelerate, we discover that as an object starts to accelerate, uh, the mass appears to increase. Now, as this mass appears to increase, uh, it gets harder and harder to accelerate the object. So whenever you think about F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, if you apply a constant force to an object and let it accelerate for a long period of time, we, as it gets faster and faster and faster, what we notice is that the acceleration starts to decrease ever so slightly and as we approach speeds approaching the speed of light where the gamma factor becomes quite large, uh, we notice that the acceleration drops off rapidly. And so for the same applied force, the acceleration diminishes, which means that in order to accelerate at the same rate you were doing before, you would have to increase the force which means that you need to put in more and more and more energy. Now, one way of thinking about this is that, uh, what we can think about is that the energy, uh, sorry, that the mass of an object is increasing, which makes sense that if the mass is increasing and you apply a constant force, the acceleration uh, must be decreasing so that the equality works. Another way to think about it is uh, that you know, so when you accelerate an object, as I can say here, as an object uh, increase in speed, not all of the energy goes into the creating and in, in, and uh, making the object's kinetic energy larger. Some of it starts going into the mass of the object, or what we would say the energy of the object, since mass and energy are related. Um, we put it more into this other form of energy, uh, which we can interpret as mass. So you can imagine that if you have 100 units of energy, for objects moving really, really slow where the gamma factor is equal to 1, you know, basically the speed is so small it's basically 0 compared to the speed of light, and the gamma factor is equal to 1. If you put 100 units of energy in, you will get 100 units of kinetic energy out based on the conservation of energy law. But as that gamma factor gets larger, we start to see that if we put 100 joules in, a small fraction of it actually goes to increasing the object's kinetic energy, and the remainder goes into this energy uh, of the mass. So it goes into the mass of the object, which means that it's apparent that the mass is harder and harder to accelerate. Turns out that gravitational fields, for instance, that this doesn't have an effect uh, at least they believe that this doesn't have an effect on the uh, gravitational field, that if you measure the gravitational field of an object, it's based off of its rest mass, not the mass that it has while it's in motion, 
uh, so the you know this mass increase uh, doesn't play a role when you're calculating gravitational fields. So the amount of curvature of space and time for objects moving at very very fast speeds, even like the Earth or the suns and or galaxies, uh, apparently uh, it is only the rest mass that matters um, in those calculations, and that's why sometimes it's very difficult to describe uh, what this mass increase really is. And some proponents will say that if we just gave up the idea of what of mass altogether and only talked about energy, this would make a lot more sense. So if we were able to just think about mass not as a mass but as energy, it would make sense to see how the energy is just converting from one form to another. So the traditional way of thinking about this um, is that as you would accelerate an object, less and less of it goes to increasing the kinetic energy, more and more goes into increasing its mass with air quotes, um, and realizing that uh, that therefore it makes it harder and harder to accelerate. So we can't reach the speed of light, and the reason we can't reach the speed of light is because this non-zero rest mass would require an infinite amount of energy in order to accelerate it to that speed. The equation is simple. Uh, it's, it's a mass increase equation. So if we wanted to calculate what this apparent increase in mass would be, we would simply calculate it like so, where this m subscript uh, o, which is m naught, this would be our rest mass. This is the mass the object would have if it was not moving at all. So another way to think about it. And we can see it's clearly the rest mass because down here you'll see that if you put 0 in here you get 1 minus uh, 0 which is 1, square root of 1 is 1, you get m equals m naught so that would be the rest mass situation. So you can use this to find out what the, the how much um, of the uh, energy went into uh, increasing the mass of the object. This leads us to another concept which is relativistic momentum. Uh, we haven't learned about momentum yet, um, but the mathematical representation for momentum is P equals mv, okay? And sorry, mv like so, all right? So it's a quantity that has kilogram units here. It has meter per second units here. So it's a kilogram meter per second. That's what the unit for momentum is. It's a vector quantity. So that will become apparent later. This is a conservative property, and we'll learn more about this later. It's a very, very important uh, property um, when you're looking at collisions of objects and things like that. So if you want to figure out the uh, relativistic momentum of an object, you would simply use, uh, instead of the rest mass, we would say, sorry, instead of the, this is the relativistic mass, relativistic mass times V, so it's exactly, it's just really what it is, and you can see it clearly here, this is just our relativistic mass. And the velocity of the object. So if you multiply those terms together, uh, what you end up with is the relativistic momentum. So this is our relativistic momentum. So objects that carry mass, as they start to increase, they're actually, their potential to, when they collide with objects, um, their momentum that they carry does increase, uh, and it does become a, a larger value at higher speeds. So let's flip the sheet over and try a couple basic questions. Well, let's go through one or two of these, um, and the remainder you can uh, figure out pretty much on your own. So let's say that you have an alien space traveler accelerated to this speed here, very quick speed. The rest mass of the traveler was known to be 210 kilograms. Calculate the dilated mass or the increased mass. Well, it's just m equals like so. And if we want to write this out further, plug in some numbers. The, the fast way to do it. If you recall, the c squared divide out, and we'll get our value. Now, what you could do 
is you could have calculated the gamma factor and then just simply multiplied 210 by the gamma factor. Okay, so I'll get you a number. I don't have my calculator handy right now, so leave that for an exercise for yourself. And you might, so, might also want to state um, this implies the gamma factor equals, so you can also write down uh, what the gamma factor is, just so you know it's a multiplier in this case. Um, question number two says an asteroid is traveling through the solar system at uh, 4100, uh, sorry, 41 kilometers per second. It's pretty quick. Uh, calculate the relativistic gamma factor. Okay, the asteroid collides with the Earth based on the impact energy video footage collected by evidence of the asteroid. Physicists were able to determine that it had a rest mass of 8,600 kilograms. Calculate what its effective mass would be as it was traveling through space. Okay, so again what it wants us to calculate is this. So it says one of the first things we want to do is find out the gamma factor. How we can do this, and I'll set this up for you and you can finish it. So the speed of the particle is 41,000 meters per second. Uh, you could put this into a percentage of C. So if you take 4100, so if you think about it this way, and we take 4100, right, and divide it by 3 exponent of 8 you will get the percentage of the speed of light so I'm just trying to sort this out I'll try and do it on my phone here you get a very very small number that's a percentage of C. Like so. And then we can figure out our gamma factor, which is going to be extremely, extremely small. Once you get your gamma factor, we can simply put it into our equation here and multiply it by the 8600 and get our final solution and that should be squared okay so um, another example here in a particle accelerator a proton is accelerated from rest to near the speed of light the rest mass of the proton is this the relativistic mass was found to be this, so it is quite a bit larger. Calculate the gamma factor. Uh, so, and it says find the speed of light. Um, and so basically, uh, we know this. To find the gamma, just simply take the relativistic mass divided by the rest mass. And so our gamma is going to be the relativistic mass, which is 2. 0 0.04 times 10 to the negative 29 divided by 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 and you'll get your gamma factor. It's going to be fairly large. The second part, especially if you've had difficulty with this before, is to use the gamma factor to try and find the speed the object, uh, This, in this case the proton, sorry, um, particle in an accelerator, a proton, so this should say electron, since we're not talking about a proton here. Um, so, you know, we can cross multiply and square, so we get like 1 minus v squared over c squared equals 1 over gamma squared, which we have calculated over here. Uh, subtract 1 
right? And then we're going to cross multiply and multiply by negative. And so what you're going to end up with is a speed of the square root of c squared, 1 minus 1 over gamma squared, like so. And then you'll be able to go from that point. So uh, this will give you the value. Let me just double check. That should be a plus, that should be a minus, yes, and multiply by c squared. And so that will tell you what the speed should be. And you could put this in terms of c. If you actually wanted to write it in terms of c, you could write uh, 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. And because this is square root of c squared, you could just put c. And this actual term here that you can see, this will give you a percentage or really not a percentage, I guess it's a fraction of the speed of light. So kind of it's another way to do it. You could get the actual meters per second if you just put it all in the calculator here and you get the meters per second. If you do it this way you'll get something like you know 0 0.9 C or something like that depending on what the value is. So I'll let you figure that out. Um, in the last one and again, you'll sort this one out as well. It tells you that the, the rest mass of this cat is 10 kilograms. Calculate the momentum when his speed is this much. So the relativist momentum is this, like so. You need to find the gamma. like so. And again, you can put this in terms of C if you wish, or just put in 1.29 times 10 to the 8 squared divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 squared, so on and so forth. And then your next term, so I'm just going to write gamma because you can figure that out. Your m naught was 10 and your speed was 1.29 times 10 to the 8, like so and the units for this answer are going to be kilogram meters per second and you can do the calculation to figure out what the gamma value is and multiply it out. So that's all there is to it. Um, in terms of the mathematics it's fairly straightforward. The difficulty really uh, lies in this sort of the conceptualization of what this mass increase looks like um, how when an object is accelerated, uh, some of that energy goes into the kinetic energy, some goes into increasing its mass, which is in, a in another way, just another way of representing energy. Um, and then therefore, we can't reach the speed of light because an infinite amount of energy would be required due to this increase. And we, we, we do notice this stuff in particle accelerators all the time. We don't notice it in our everyday life because our speeds are so slow.